Hello, good morning everyone and a very, very warm welcome uh, to everyone joining us today for this DPD Breathe Easy discussion event produced by Green TV. I'm Rachel Burden, I host the BBC Five Live Breakfast show most mornings and also at BBC Breakfast Television as well, but it's brilliant to be in the company of you as guests and all our speakers here today. This year, uh, my world, my world of work, but everybody's world has been dominated by the emergence of this vicious respiratory illness uh, that has come to dominate our lives in ways we could just never have imagined and has been a very traumatic experience for so many people. But it's also thrown a light on fundamental issues around clean air, whether that's city smog disappearing from our streets in lockdown, whether it's discussion about airborne particles and the dangers of those, whether it's about the vulnerabilities of people living with breathing conditions, for example, or those living in areas of high density population. The whole subject of clean air, air pollution, is something that we live and literally breathe every day. But it hasn't always been at the front of policymakers' minds, perhaps, or at the front of the media agenda, or maybe at the front of people's lives in their everyday business. So there is a question about whether now this is a moment that can change all of that. And also, what is the role of industry to spearhead that change too? And these are some of the issues that we're gonna be covering in our discussion today, which will be really wide ranging actually from many, many different viewpoints. We have a brilliant panel of speakers. So let me just explain to you a little bit about how this is gonna work. Each of our speakers will set out their stall, if you like, for five minutes or so, and then I'll have an opportunity to feed questions to them from you, our audience. Then we're going to bring in some keynote speakers. We're going to hear from Garant Thomas, uh, MP, who's part of the All Parliamentary Group uh, on Air Pollution. We're also going to hear from Andy Street, who's the Mayor of the West Midlands uh, Combined Authority, and Rosamond Adu Kisi Deborah, who, uh, as a result of her own personal story has become intrinsically involved in campaigning for better air quality and I'm delighted to say she's also part of the audience and listening along today and then at the end we'll bring all these people together and there'll be an opportunity for everyone to discuss the issues that have arisen throughout the course of the morning but also for you to put your questions so I'm sure all of you are familiar with Zoom by now but actually just to remind you the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens is the best way to get in touch with us. If you want to submit a question, that would be brilliant at any stage at all during the course of the morning. We've got a team filtering them all and I'll be keeping an eye on them as well. Probably won't get through all of them, but we'll certainly try to do as many as we possibly can. And also, if you need to access the additional live transcript, that's fully up and running too. Equally, if it's there and you'd rather not have it, just go to the live transcript button at the bottom of your screens and uh, you can eliminate that. But it's all there for you if you need it. So I'm really, really looking forward uh, to the whole event this morning. And I just want to remind you of who else we've got speaking before we go to our first speaker. Uh, we've got Ollie Crawn, who's head of CSR at DPD. Oliver Lord, who's head of policy and campaigns at Global Clean Air, the Environmental Defence Europe group. We've got Tom Byrne, who's head of CSR for ASOS. Uh, but we're going to start this morning by hearing from Professor Francis Pope, who is the brains amongst us all, possibly, uh, Chair of Atmospheric Science from the School of Geography, Earth and Environmental Sciences, Sciences at the University of Birmingham. And a very warm welcome to you as I hand over to Dr. Francis Pope. Thank you, Rachel. Hello all, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invite. So, so as, as introduced, I'm Francis Pope. I'm a professor of atmospheric science at the University of Birmingham. And I've been tasked with giving you just a snapshot of the science behind air pollution at the moment. So next slide, please. Um, so when I talk about air pollution today, what I'm gonna be talking about is particulate matter air pollution. So particulate matter as the name sounds like are these little particles in the air that we breathe in every day. So to give you a sense of the size we're interested in, the human hair is about 70 microns across, and the size that we're interested in is anything lower than 10 microns inside, so one seventh of the size of the human hair. 
And what tends to happen is as these little particles get smaller and smaller, they get more they get worse and worse for our health. So we tend to break them up into two size ranges. In particular, there's PM10, which is this less than 10 microns, so one seventh of your hair. And then there's PM2.5, which is the finer stuff, which is about one one thirtieth of the size of your human hair. And it's the smaller stuff that tends to be worse for us. And it's also the smaller stuff that tends to come from um, human activities. Um, so that just gives you a sense of what we're looking for. And all the compositions are different in here. So can we go to the next slide, please? So this, uh, this image shows you where these different sizes of particle get to in our body. So of course, our first interaction with them is as we breathe them in. So the first size we're interested in, this particles, which are about PM10, so that's the one seventh the size of our hair, that gets into our upper respiratory tract and stops there. Then the finer stuff, which there's, gets further down into our lungs. So that's the PM2.5 that gets into our lungs. And so that starts interacting in there. And then when we get smaller and smaller, it gets further and further into our lungs. And when we get to the really small stuff, then that can start getting into our bloodstream. And there's a lot of research around at the moment showing how these particles can interact with all the organs in the body. They can pass all through the body. They can even get up to our brain. So there's a, there's a growing body of work which is really showing that not only does this particular matter affect our physical health, it can also start to affect our cognitive health, our mental health. Um, and what we should think about is, is in terms of our daily lives, this, this ability of the PM to affect our health, to affect our cognition, that affects how our children can study, that affects how we can do our work. Uh, so we're very much a high-tech country at the moment, so our ability to think is probably more important than our ability to lift things up nowadays. So this link to cognition, I think, is very important we'll, and will become only more important as we go through. Uh, next slide, please. So I was asked by the team just to give a, a very brief snapshot of some of my research. So my research really goes all the way from the micro to the city scale. So, um, so what I thought I would do is I'd give two examples. So the first example is really looking at a single piece of uh, particulate matter. So what we have here on the right hand side is some very complicated equipment at the central laser facility at the Rutherford Appleton Labs in uh, Oxford. And this is work I've done with Andy Ward. So here, what we're doing is we're levitating, trapping a single particle, and we can see it, that's the green dot at the center of your screen. And so we can do very precise measurements on single particles. We can understand how the physics change, how the chemistry change, how the biology changes. So from that very precise measurements, we go all the way up to the city scale. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is some work I've been doing recently with um, an artist called uh, Robin Price. And so what he does is he images the air pollution in cities using uh, long exposure photography. And so I've picked out three of his images here from three different countries. So one is in Ethiopia, one is in India, and one is in the UK. Um, and so the density of the dots, the number of dots that gives you an indication of how how much air pollution is and one of the troubles with air pollution is it's largely invisible so the idea behind this work was to try and make the invisible visible so on the left uh, first of all we have ethiopia and it's actually relatively clean there below who guidelines in the middle we've got a picture from port talbot in wales so this is near the steelworks um, and so this is just slightly over who guidelines and this maybe shows you the tension between industry and clean air and air pollution and on the right, we have a picture from Delhi, actually in a children's playground. Um, and this is unfortunately one of the most polluted cities in the world at the moment. So we're about at least 30 times over our WHO guidelines. But again, this shows us looking at the city scale. So going from that micro to city scale. Can I have the next slide, please? So something that my group is very interested and in, very keen to make sure that people understand is how do we define vulnerability to air pollution? So I think there's three lenses to look at this through. There's the exposure, so how much air pollution is there and how does that vary through the city? And this nice work by DPD we'll hear from today will tell us about that. Also, we need to think about susceptibility. We need to think who is affected particularly by air pollution. So it turns out the younger are affected, the older are affected, and those with pre-existing conditions are affected. And finally, and, and just as importantly, we need to think about the adaptive capacity. And put simply, how, 
how how able are we to engineer ourselves out of the problem? How able are we to pay ourselves out of the problem? So can we afford to have air conditioning in the house? Can we afford to have air conditioning in our cars? Can we afford a face mask, etc.? So I think it's important to remember this and how all these three things vary throughout our cities. So just the final slide now, please. So just about this work, I think it's really exciting. So typically what we've got to look at air pollution in the UK is fixed sites. And so we've got a very nice fixed site network in the UK. So on the left, this is where the fixed sites, these measure air pollution, very high quality. And there's about 170 of these in the UK. But that means we've only got one site per 400,000 people. And depending where you are, there's very little information. So even if we look at London in the middle picture, what we can see, the, the sites are indicated by the green bubbles. And what you can see, depending where you are in London, you can have very little information. And so this is why I think this work by DPT, you know, it's really, really useful. So what they're doing is measuring the spatial variability of air pollution. And we can start to see where the hot spots are and how people interact with them. Again, going back to that previous figure of how does exposure interact with susceptibility, interact with adaptive capacity. And with that, I'd like to end. Thank you. Francis, thank you so much. Um, I think the illustrations that you have shown us there are, are quite horrifying if you've never seen anything like that before. Uh, and I do wonder, and this sounds like a kind of slightly trite question, but because we're talking about such tiny, tiny things, is it just difficult, do you think, for people outside your realm of expertise to get their head around the damage that can be done by something so small? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think so. This this invisibility problem is a big problem. You know, it's very easy to forget about it if you can't see it. I think the other problem is people tend to feel quite helpless about it. You know, so what can I do which will actually make a difference? You know, is you need everyone to reduce their um, polluting behaviour to really make a difference. So, to my mind, they're the two things that we need to we meet, need to make the problem more visible, whether that's via art, science, crossovers, etc. But we also need to give people good 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 tips and hints on how they can make the air pollution in their local vicinity better so to give them agency to help them make a difference i mentioned rosamond uh kissy deborah who is listening along to this and she raises a really important question i'm sure you, you know her she says hi dr pope can the damage caused by ultra fine particles ever be reversed um that's a really good question um so certainly we know that the effects of air pollution are chronic. So the more our lifetime exposure to it, the, the worse the effects will likely be. Um, and there's a growing body of evidence to show that acute, as in short term effects of air pollution can have a big effect as well. I mean, I wouldn't like to say definitively, but I think both sides are important. So certainly it's, it's if you're exposed to high pollution, you know, that, that's not the end of the story. If you improve your situation, you can make, make your life, your um, health better. So I think, yes, so certainly you do have agency in that respect. There are so many questions coming through here. Uh, let me bring you this one. Do you have any insights on when governments start measuring ultrafine particles and will start regulating their emissions? Um, that's, I guess there's not a definite date, but there's a clear move. The, the understanding that it is the ultrafines, which are the most important, it is very obvious now. And, we're expecting further guidelines from the World's, World Health Organization soon. Uh, I don't know exactly when that's going to be released, but it will be soon, I am told. And a great question here from Caitlin, who says, thank you, Dr. Pope. Would you recommend people continue to wear masks after the pandemic to help protect against air pollution, especially in cities like London? Um, it's a really good question. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the mask myself in terms of just, you know, my daily life. Um, but I think, you know, if you commute next to a particularly busy road, if you cycle next to a particularly busy road, then clearly you can filter out some of the uh, the majority of it. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously it's a personal choice. Um, and I think for certain situations, it could help. Uh, I'd prefer to see pollution go down rather than us putting engineering Dealing you know, with the it, fundamental cause rather than the outcomes, for sure. Absolutely. These are really interesting areas of discussion, and there are loads of questions that have come through. So I'm delighted, Francis, that you're going to be with us uh, throughout the course of, of the morning, and we'll come back to some of those um, during the panel discussion later. Thank you so much for the time being, uh, Dr. Pa Francis Pope. So time now to move on to our next speaker, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Oliver Lord. Now, Oliver Lord is Head of Policy and Campaigns at the Global Clean Air Environmental Defence Group Europe. 
It's a long title, Oliver. I hope I got it right for you this morning, but tell us a bit about uh, the work that you're doing there. Thanks, Rachel. Yes, uh, I'm from Environmental Defence Fund Europe. We're part of a global NGO uh, and I'm part of our global clean air initiative. We're putting demonstration projects uh, across the world in uh, California, China, India and uh, here in the UK. Um, and we're working hard to make that uh, invisible visible, which is exactly what um, Francis was saying needs to happen. And in the US as well, especially working on the electrification of medium and heavy duty vehicles, which of course is very linked to the freight sector. So next slide, please. So Francis was talking about um, helping people to understand and be more aware of uh, the impact of air, air pollution. And, and actually around the world, 1 billion people lack the information about the air they breathe. And we're determined to try and put that right. So we're a big supporter of the Open AQ project, which I've put a, a thumbnail of uh, the launch of their new report. And this is a platform that we've been contributing to with a project we did in London called Breathe London, which doubled the amount of air quality uh, monitors using smaller, lower cost sensors so that we could calibrate the technology and then start to spread that more globally into areas that, where people don't have access to this information. And as the UN Secretary General said, when urban communities are engaged in policy and decision making and empowered with financial resources, the results are more inclusive and durable. And that's exactly what air quality monitoring uh, is about. And it's about finding air pollution hotspots in cities so that we can take action quickly. We can measure how well interventions are working. And we really know, we've learned from, for example, the history of diesel that, and, and combined heat and power technology in buildings that we need to learn the lessons of, of policies uh, that have been brought in because sometimes they don't quite match uh, where we want to be headed. And of course, it's raising uh, public awareness as well because we know that if we're in London where we're doing a lot of our work at the minute, it really affects people's decisions in their day-to-day -day lives and especially parents and those cycling around the city. Next slide, please. But um, we learn from this data that the burden of air pollution is not equal. Um, this is some new analysis we've been doing that should be out later this week. We found, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about NOx emissions today as well, which is uh, related to nitrogen dioxide, a harmful gas in the atmosphere that is also invisible. And the UK has been breaching uh, legal limits for the past 10 years and continues to do so, especially in London. It's a diesel issue predominantly. And when we look at the levels of this uh, pollutant at primary schools with pupils from the most deprived areas, so the pupils that are attending from the most deprived areas, we're seeing a 27% um, higher level of this pollutant than uh, those in the least deprived. And the same applies to pupils that come from a black, Asian, minority, ethnic background as well. So we also need to be tackling these health inequities in society with this data. And you know, quite frankly, we need stronger representation and, uh, and voices from these communities. And uh, uh, sadly, today's panel is an example of that, but we need to do more. Next slide, please. So using this data, we can also start to understand what the causes of the pollution are. And when we look at uh, emissions inventories put out by London, diesel vans, for example, can make up to 25% of the road transport NOx emissions. Um, and you can start to make out the road network there. And even the latest diesel technology in cars, for example, they regenerate. So their diesel particulate filters, thinking about the PM 2.5s that um, Francis is talking about, at times they'll emit a thousand more than they're allowed to because of the way that filter technology has to regenerate and actually splurge it out into the city. Next slide, please. So you link that uptake of, of diesel technology and then you link it with the growth in van traffic and delivery traffic as well. And, the McKinsey model for the World Economic Forum has shown that delivery vehicles in the 100 largest cities will rise by 36%. And you can see that we're seeing an exponential growth in, in van traffic as well. So it's a bit of a double whammy coming our way. Next slide, please. So when you link that together, you have to start to think about what action and policies we need. So especially for nitrogen dioxide, we need to see diesel free cities. And that's exactly where clean air zone policies really uh, will have an impact and we have to work with those because it's the only credible way to be meeting uh, the legal limits in our cities, having less polluting vehicles. We also need to see much more incentives for electric vehicles and support. So it's great to see the fleet that DPD have been introducing and especially in London, more priority for these vehicles in cities, perhaps nighttime access for couriers because they're much quieter as well. And noise pollution is also a big issue. 
But this is part of a global movement. So I put a thumbnail there of um, C40 cities, green and healthy streets declaration. Major cities around the world will be introducing uh, zero emission zones soon. And that means full uh, zero emission vehicles, not just plug-in hybrids, which often have quite weak electric motors. Next slide, please. So we go with cleaner vehicles, but we also need fewer vehicles. And this is also related very strongly to the PM2.5 issue, because when we look at, for example, the concentrations of PM2.5s by primary schools, you can see a huge swathe coming from the tire and brake wear of vehicles. So thinking about the government's commitment to promote cycling for the carriage of freight in their, in their new vision, and also the uh, DPD approach to um, switching to more uh, cycling freight as well, is really going to be essential to uh, bringing down those levels of PM2.5, tackling the local sources, of course, because there's other sources coming into the city. Next slide, please. So when you kind of put that together, I'm starting to so I'll throw a vision to you that actually we really need to rethink um, how the roads are working in our cities to tackle this pollution problem. And in the middle of the busiest roads that you can see in London, on the left are the levels of PM2.5, on the right is the noise pollution this, this city uh, faces. You can really make out that road network. So if we can bring those policies together and help to transform the roads, roads where a lot of people live, then we're gonna make it better for everyone. So if you had 27 billion pounds to spend on building new roads in the UK, Perhaps you would actually want to spend it, next slide please, on unbuilding some of the roads that these, uh, uh, some of the roads that are actually causing the biggest damage to health in the UK. And here's a couple of examples uh, from Spain that, um, to, to get our juices flowing. So I'll finish with this last slide, which is just a, uh, some more reading for you, which is around uh, a blueprint that we put out um, on air quality monitoring, and then also a recent bit of research that we've done into looking how couriers and uh, drivers that own their own vehicles can come together to um, purchase vehicles and actually make it more affordable for them. Thanks very much. Oliver, thank you so much. And it's always shocking, isn't it, to hear um, how regularly governments, including our own, breach legal air pollution limits as well. Um, again, loads of questions coming in here. Um, let me start off with a sort of very simple one. In your experience, what do you consider to be an essential component of successful clean air policy? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose for me, it's it's about putting in timescales into that policy. So for example, when uh, I used to work um, with, with the Mayor of London and we developed the ultra low emission zone and we actually, we worked with industry to give a suitable timescale so that they can move with the grain. So I think in the introduction of clean air zones, for example, setting that policy and saying in a few years time, things are gonna change then I think uh, you can really bring the business uh, with you rather than going against it. Sasha has asked this question, should there be policies in place to make people more aware about the air they breathe, for example, when they're buying a house, where they work, where they go to school and so on? And how would you suggest that this is best communicated? Are we going to see that increasingly being used, do you think? Uh, I think that's really important, especially for at-risk groups. So thinking about the parents and, and school children, uh, in London, there's actually an alert system, um, and that's something that sadly the UK lacks. Really, it's all it's all down to a, a small uh, Twitter feed from DEFRA. So I think that a lot more could be done about that. Um, and like we were talking about, you know, if you give people more information, the more they're going to act. And and as we know, I've got a psychology background. It's when people actually change significant moments in life. So moving house is a really good one. If you can give people empower people the information to understand the pollution levels at certain times of day but also the choices they have to move around when they move into that new neighbourhood. There's a local bike route, there's a car sharing scheme nearby, and that's when people will change their, um, their habits. And, but and interesting, that. interestingly, you also rightly highlight the health inequities that we're facing at the moment, which again have been really highlighted by COVID. And mm. you could start paying a premium, couldn't you, for better air quality, and that, that doesn't solve the problem. Not at all, no. Um, and just finally one here before we move on, does air pollution affect mental health? Over the last 10 years, we've seen a jump in mental health and pollution. Are the two linked? What do we know about that? Well, it's incredible, like the health research coming out with the links with air pollution. Um, there was a recent uh, research into the impact on dementia, which is really sad. And we saw the uh, research coming out from British Lung Foundation so showing how many care homes across the UK are cited in areas that um, breach World Health Organization. But you link, as I was saying, you link like getting cleaner electric vehicles and getting out of diesel with quieter vehicles as well. And you can see the crossover there with noise pollution, which is often not talked about enough. And I think the two come together 
um, to make a stressful environment for people and affect their mental health. Well, thank you so much. And there are so many great questions coming through. I do hope we get time, which we will, I'm sure, in, in the panel session to, to bring some of the issues up that people are raising. So apologies if you're feeling frustrated that there's something you desperately want to talk about. We'll try and make sure that we raise it um, in our discussion towards the end. But Oliver, for the time being, thank you. And a reminder that you can submit questions at any stage when a speaker is talking, we'll see them, we'll log them, and then we'll uh, raise them again a little bit later on. So time now to move on to our next guest. Uh, delighted to welcome Tom Byrne, who's head of CER for ASOS. Over to you, Tom. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, as mentioned, so I'm um, head of CSR at ASOS. And uh, as way of a brief introduction for those less familiar with us, we are an online fashion retailer for 20-somethings all over the world. Um, and our purpose is to give customers the confidence to be who they want to be, which is a, it's important for our brand and particularly important for, for my team. Um, we, we sell over 850 brands, including our own label fashion brands, uh, and we do have customers all over the world. Uh, last year, we sent 80 million orders to over 200 countries, um, and we fulfill those orders from fulfillment centers in the UK, in Germany, and, and the US. Uh, and we recently um, just announced a second performance center in the UK to help fuel our domestic and international growth. Um, next slide, please. In regards to sustainability, um, this falls under our Fashion with Integrity program, um, which has four key uh, pillars. Um, our products, which is all about the products we sell, um, that we manufacture ourselves, but also that we sell on behalf of third party brands. Um, our business, which is all about the operational sustainability of us as a company. Um, our customers, and this is really making sure that we're living the values of our customers and achieving our, our brand purpose. And our community, which is all about supporting the communities that support us. Um, I'm going to talk about mainly our business because that's where um, the topic of air quality and emissions from our deliveries um, is really focused. Uh, next slide, please. So a, a key element of the Our Business pillar has been our Carbon 2020 program. Um, and this has been aimed at reducing primarily carbon emissions from our operations over the last five years. Um, I'm happy to say that since 2016, we've reduced operational carbon emissions per order by 30%. Um, which is the equivalent of avoiding 130,000 tonnes of, of CO2 um, every single year. Now, what this graph is trying to depict is that the majority of our operational impact in regards to emissions comes with the transportation of goods. Um, so you can see here, 90% in total uh, is linked to transport, and 60% of that um, of that total is about delivery and returns emissions. So goods getting to and from our customers. So in regards to how we tackle our environmental issues, um, the, the delivery of goods to our consumers is really, really important. And that's been a key focus area for us in how we improve our operational sustainability and, and how we reduce our emissions. Um, but it's also had some added, in, added benefit and, some, and shone some light on the issue of air quality because a number of our activities in regards to managing our emissions and, and, um, and in increasing our delivery sustainability obviously has impacts on air quality as well. And air quality and air pollution is probably something that we'll look at in more detail moving forwards as we, as we progress with our decarbonisation plans. Next slide, please. In terms of what we're actually doing then to, to, to address the issue of air quality and carbon emissions, well, I think the first thing first is to, is to keep working with partners such as DPD, um, who clearly share our vision and our values, and, and we have some shared goals in this space. Um, ASOS does not operate its own fleet, so we do rely on our delivery partners all over the world to deliver goods to our customers safely, quick, quickly and efficiently. And so it's very hard for us to achieve our goals without working with partners who um, who can enable that, and DPD are definitely one of those. Um, you know, we're extremely supportive of our delivery partners moving to lower emission vehicles, to zero emission vehicles, and we're pleased to say that all over the world our partners are doing that, and uh, it's something that we're obviously very keen to support. It's also something that we know our customers directly benefit from, so customers in urban areas who are receiving more and more of our goods in um, zero emission vehicles, we know it's a great benefit to them. We also know that's something that they're increasingly interested in, and they're going to want they, they're going to want to work with brands and shop with brands who are taking this um, issue seriously down the line. Next slide, please. I, a couple of other areas where we're trying to address this um, issue ourselves in our own way. Um, one of them is about consolidating deliveries and returns, and the other is just about reducing returns um, to begin with. 
So when I, when I say about consolidating deliveries and returns, this is a, this is about ensuring that only one delivery is made wherever possible. So um, believe it or not, there's many ASOS customers out there who will place two or three orders in one day, uh, sometimes in quite quick succession. Um, and previously, this was triggering perhaps two or three different orders, maybe going in, in different vehicles to that customer. So we're now able to recognize this and make sure that when this happens, we can consolidate these into one order, into one parcel and one vehicle. So doing, doing our bit to try to remove um, the number of trips going to our customers and, and, and hopefully removing the amount of vehicles going into urban areas. Um, and we're also doing this for our returns as well. So making sure our customers can consolidate their returns into one parcel, they, they can ship it back to us um, in, in one go and in one trip. Another key area for us that we're looking at is reducing returns just generally. You know, our business model does allow returns like many retailers, um, but we're really working hard to make sure that our customers get what they want the first time. Um, because not only is it just a better customer experience, but it's also, um, it also leads to some great environmental benefits as well. So um, one way we're doing this is through new technology such as our fit assistant. So helping customers understand their sizing better, understand how that sizing data then applies to ASOS products so they can get the right size the first time. And another thing that we've turned on recently is product reviews. So customers can read more about a product they want to buy, make a more informed decision based on its sizing feedback, on, its, on, on how it looks and feels. So customers, again, um, were hopeful of, of having what they want first time round, therefore reducing the amount of trips going back to our fulfillment centers and return centers. So these are things that not only hopefully create a better customer experience, but also create you know, an added environmental benefit particularly around the issues of carbon emissions, but also urban air quality. Uh, next slide, please. I think in terms of next steps, there's more for us to do in this space. And, um, and we're currently in the process of setting, of setting our new long-term targets um, on, our, on our deliveries, on our returns, and everything to do with our operational sustainability. And we're looking to link these new targets to the science as closely as possible. And I'm sure air quality as an issue will become more and more important for us to think about, um, as well as continue to decarbonize our, our business. Um, another really key next step for us is simply working with more partners, such as DPD and others around the world, who are taking this seriously. And so making sure that we are partnering with those who can deliver to our customers in ways that is, um, is less harmful to the environment, that is less harmful for issues like urban pollution, and making sure that we are looking at these partners as much as possible and work with them where possible as well. Thank you very much. I think that's all for me and happy to take some questions. There are loads of questions coming in. Of course, Tom, this is a huge subject for so many people um, watching and watching today. Um, one key one, perhaps, is this one. Has carbon been reduced at production level? What do you want to say about that? Sure. Yeah. So we are um, we are members of, um, of, of uh, the SCAP um, scheme in, in the UK, where we report against our product uh, emissions uh, every single year and they've been coming down steadily since we've joined and when I talk about our new targets that we're going to be setting um, this, these will be business-wide targets where we're looking at not only the operational impact that we have as a business but also the impact of our products that we produce ourselves for the products that we, we, we sell from third-party brands too and, and we know customers are, are more attuned to this we know customers are now you know, uh, in, in, for our generation of, of, of audience, at least, asking a lot more questions about it. So we want to be there making sure we have the answers to those questions. Uh, and, and, and certainly the product emissions from our business will be incorporated into our future strategy. Well, actually, that's a really interesting point because it's something that Shane brings up on his question. Thank you, Shane. Tom, he asks, do you have any insights about how conscious or concerned your shoppers are about emissions and pollution associated with their online orders? So is it, it's not going to be necessarily front of people's minds, but how much does it influence um, who they buy with, how much they buy, how often they buy? I think that's a, that's a really great question and something that we're learning more every single day. I, th I think in the last 12 months, we've certainly been uh, more proactive with talking to our customers about these issues. So telling them about our mission programs, telling them about how we're working with partners like DPD to move to electric vehicles. And the response has been you know, overwhelmingly positive. So I think it's on us and other brands to make sure that we are actively communicating about these issues to customers to let them know what we're doing. And they're having some feedback as well um, and making sure we are listening to their concerns and hopefully we have the answers for them. And if we don't, we'll work on plans so we have the answers for them in the future. 
because that's always going to be a challenge with a high volume business like yourself. Nikos asks this. Hi, Tom. How important would you say it is that customers order products all at once rather than one at a time at different times when considering your deliveries and your returns policy of ensuring one delivery wherever possible? Sure, I suppose well, how do you I, encourage more responsible purchasing behaviour from your customers without putting them off buying from you, which is obviously fundamental to your business model? Sure, and you know, and, and convenience is, um, is 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 highly important for us, and so we want to make sure customers, you know, can buy whenever they want, and and we can make sure that we are doing that responsibly. I think you know, doing things like our consolidated deliveries does that for the customer. So if you are buying two or three things in one day, we'll do that for you. Um, and I'm sure there's there's ways in the future where we can we can get smarter at doing that for on the customer's behalf as well. And I think we are moving towards a trend of customers buying, you know, um, buying. Um, you know, more consciously understanding what they're purchasing and um, and and so therefore, you know, limiting returns. And something that we're very keen to help with as well by making sure we can, you know, give them the right information when they need it at, at checkout, um, they get what they want the first time. Tom, I'm really pleased you're going to stay with us as well for the panel discussion at the end. Loads of questions coming in. So again, we'll see if we can raise some of those with you a little bit later on. Right now, though, it's time to move on to our final speaker before we go to our keynote speech. Uh, today and our final speaker is Ollie Crawn from DPD themselves. He is also head of CSR at the company. Over to you, Ollie. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, everyone. All of our speakers have explained how air quality affects us all, and that's why at DPD we take this really seriously and have a industry-leading green strategy to reduce our emissions. As part of that strategy, next slide, please. We launched Project Breathe last summer in August in central London. We fixed 100 mobile sensors to our vehicles operating in central locations in the city and 20 fixed locations using our pickup shop network. And the pickup shops, um, we tried to uh, fix those sensors that were placed closer to schools and play areas because as we've heard throughout today, the effects on children are even higher um, than adults. So we thought it was important to position those sensors there. These sensors take a reading every 12 seconds and feed back to our data dashboard. And they're at street level, so they're measuring the air we are breathing whilst we're walking down the street, they're not up high, they're not placed near pollution areas um, like tailpipes. They're on the roof of the van. Very easy to fit um, and no, no larger than really a broadband router that you would have at home. So very discreet um, and a great tool to measure the air. Next slide, please. And what we've done um, is we've scheduled to expand our uh, Project Breathe, our air monitoring uh, program, to five other cities. Next slide, please. Those cities um, will go live in the coming month once we can install those sensors. And once that is completed, we will have a network of over 400 sensors throughout the UK measuring 2.5 p.m. data um, every 12 seconds and feeding back to the dashboard. They, that means that approximately 1.5 million readings a day that we're um, providing access to, to uh, local authorities, uh, government agencies, and academic institutions like Francis Pope, to be able to analyze that data and look at the hotspots and again base decisions on proper scientific data that can really have a positive impact to the people that live in these towns and cities. Next slide please. And this is a copy of what you would see. The dashboard itself um, powered by PolluteTrack, the manufacturers of the set sensors um, they provide detail where you can drill down 
the academic institutions, the local government can look at specific times, rush hour traffic, you know, the hot spots that that creates in certain areas of those towns and cities. And we're going to go a step further. We're going to um, open up on our notification, our delivery notification, this process and this screen where the consumer themselves can look at the air quality in their city on that day and it will gauge it using the WHO guidelines. So again, it's not just the powerful data that could be used for our government, local government and uh, academic institutions to help them make decisions and create studies on the impact of poor, poor air quality. But our consumers can actually see raising awareness um, of how it affects and impacts each, each individual. Next slide, please. Our green strategy, it all encompasses improving air quality. And we're working extremely hard to decarbonize our fleet throughout the UK. Our vision 25, 25, 25 is going to deliver 25% of our entire volume by the end of 2025 on an all electric fleet, zero emissions in these urban areas. And that covers approximately 25% of the entire UK population, providing cleaner cities across the UK and also quieter because electric vehicles have that element to them too. Next slide, please. And with the green strategy, the 25, 25, 25, will increase our deliveries enormously. You can see here, 2019, we delivered 1.3 million parcels on our electric fleet. And our electric fleet at the time was about 149 vehicles. We fast forward to 2020, a challenging year, obviously, with the pandemic. We actually increased our electric fleet throughout the UK to over 700 vehicles and delivered, as a result, 11.2 million parcels on our all-electric fleet, zero emissions. And what we're aiming to do, as I've said, by the end of 2025, deliver over 100 million parcels, all electric, in our, uh, across the UK, zero emissions, creating better environment for people, consumers and the public to live and breathe. Next slide, please. And it just doesn't stop there. We already power all of our sites from a renewable source of electricity. But recently we have Open Hub 5 and we've started the installation of over 7,000 solar panels. And that will create enough energy to deliver nearly 4 million parcels, all electric, zero emissions, powered by a renewable source. And you can see that we're really making some progress with decarbonizing our operation. Next slide, please. And last year we launched our website. It shows our green journey and is updated regularly. Please visit it. It has more information on there. It keeps you up to date and shows exactly everything we're doing in the green space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ollie. Do you have, Ollie, one of the sensors with you to hand? Can you show us? Sadly, Rachel, it didn't arrive from France oh, in time. No. I do apologise. We did discuss that um, on a call, but sadly it's not. But if you imagine your home broadband router, yeah. you know, it's that size. They're discreet. They're not causing a problem. They're not monstrosity. They're easy to fit to these vehicles. And uh, they, they just need an electrical um, feed to power them. And that is it, you know, so it, very simple, straightforward. And like um, Francis said, putting these on vehicles provides a wider scope of data, you know, across these cities instead of fixed locations, which have their limitations, obviously. 
Well, perhaps it's a new family game for a car journey, spot the sensor. Um, it, it does seem like it, in many ways, businesses are moving at, at a greater pace than government policy on all of this. And there's a good question from uh, Nikos on this, who says, would you say that logistics companies are more influential than governments in gathering air quality data for the public to see? Um, I, I've not heard of another logistics business monitoring air quality like uh, DPD UK and DPD Group in Europe. Um, I think there's more space for private and public sectors to work together to enhance um, and increase the amount of data that could be fed back and used positively, definitely. Yeah. And, and the other question uh, that a couple of people have brought up this morning, actually, is about emissions from tyres, which anyone in any discussion for, about electric vehicles will know about. Um, and the question is, given that some people think they can be as polluting or certainly um, it, that requires monitoring as much as other uh, um, emissions, what plans do you have to tackle that? Do you have a way of monitoring that? Uh, well, actually, um, I believe there was a DEFRA report in 2019 stating that um, PM 2.5 particles is more coming off tyres than actually at tailpipes. Um, I, I, may, I may be wrong there, but I, that's what I've read. And um, we're actually working part of the Transport for London Freight Lab. Uh, we're working with them and a company called Enso on a tyre that reduces the amount of particle matter coming off it. So we are looking at other ways of minimising our impact in the environment, definitely. Yeah, and, and look, I'm sure that's something that um, Francis and, and Oliver Lord will be able to pick up on as well during our panel discussion. And a reminder, if you want to submit questions for that discussion coming up in a few minutes time, uh, where we'll take on some of these issues, then please do via the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen. Um, Ollie, congratulations on uh, Project Breathe, says this one here. Excellent innovation. How important do DPD feel uh, vehicle manufacturers are playing their part, driving down the cost of EVs to deliver price parity with their diesel equivalents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for any sort of run of the mill discussion about EVs, again, it's something we discuss on the BBC the whole time. That is what people bring up time and again, cost. It's a huge investment, Rachel. You know, I can't deny that at all. It's, it's massive. Uh, typically, a, to, to go out and buy a, an electric vehicle, especially the larger ones, you're talking about potentially a £20,000 difference to an ICE equivalent, a diesel equivalent. So, you know, smaller businesses, your, you know, plumber, electrician, builder working in central London or, or other cities are probably not going to move forward to electric unless they're, you know, reduced in cost or there are more government grants. But we need to do more to reduce the, the cost increase the availability. I think putting targets on imports of vehicles, you know, a certain percentage of those need to be electric, you know, from our manufacturers abroad and, and, and in the UK. And that needs to be ramped up each year to 2030 when we ban the, the sale of new uh, diesel and petrol vehicles. Oh, brilliant. Uh, and again, you'll be back for the discussion uh, once we've heard from our keynote speakers as well, but for the moment, uh, we'll let you go. And that is perhaps a very good time, actually, to introduce a politician to the discussion. I'm, I'm delighted to say uh, that he's been with us, I think, for about 10 minutes or so, so he may have heard the end of, of what our last guest was saying. But Garrett Davis, MP for Swansea West, is here with us now. He is chair of the all-party parliamentary group on air pollution. Garrett, a very warm welcome to DPD Breathe Easy. I'll hand over to you now. Hey, uh, great to hear uh, that get invite uh, from you, Rachel. And it was great to listen to all of what Ollie had to say, uh, said, which, which was very refreshing. Um, it is the case, as he said, that, you know, the sort of things that DPD are doing, in particular on monitors, are particularly important in raising the amount of information that's out there to keep the political pressure on from the public to drive forward to get cleaner air. Um, I'm sure people will know that, you know, the latest estimates of... Um, deaths each year are in the region of 64,000 premature deaths in Britain alone. Obviously, it's something like 7 million globally at a cost of something like £20 billion 
a year to the economy and to the health service. So we do need to uh, sort this out. People will also know that air pollution essentially attacks, uh, makes people older uh, by attacking your lungs, your hearts, your minds. So primarily we're talking about lung disease, heart disease, strokes and the like, but it also affects unborn babies, smaller particulates getting into the bloodstream, affects the mental health of uh, young children and older children, of course, uh, dementia is affected as well. Um, it, I think everyone will, will be aware of the coroner's report at the end of last year for Ella Kissimmee, uh, Kissy Deborah, who's a nine-year-old girl who died after going to hospital 28 times in just three years for asthma, it, basically induced by um, air pollution. And uh, I visited the uh, George Eustace Environment Secretary with, with her mother to press that the Environment Bill, which is still going through Parliament, uh, has specific World Health Organization air quality enforceable limits in them, in it rather. And indeed, uh, there's, an, there's a part of the bill that to ensure that all our government departments work together to improve air quality, because DEFRA, of course, doesn't build the roads or set the the duties. Um, this is quite a complicated scientific area. Of course, the uh, World Health Organization limits uh, required would be 10 micrograms or should be required a 10 micrograms per cubic meter by 2030. Uh, Ollie mentioned different sorts of particulates. It's slightly confusing because obviously diesel particulates are more toxic than those from tires. Uh, but we do need to drive forward and the government's already agreed that we should end, we should have all the new vehicles would be um, non-diesel fossil fuel by 2030. Uh, and I agree with Ollie that we should be looking in this current budget as well as further incentives to drive forward, in particular, you know, people who've got less money to switch more quickly, uh, including vans, of course, uh, towards um, electric vehicles. And we should also look at sort of the issue around indoor air quality and how that mixes up with outdoor air quality. You mentioned as well the issue of children. It's important that children are safe inside the school in terms of in, indoor air quality and outside to basically stop loitering and idling. And, and again, overall, as we emerge out of COVID, uh, you know, I welcome people working a bit more from home, but we really do need to electrify our whole uh, transport system. So um, I think uh, DVD is uh, taking major leadership here. I welcome that and would encourage that sort of activity across the industrial sector. Uh, my background's in, in large companies as well, as well as starting small companies. And clearly companies are looking to the future in terms of the costs and benefits of investing in a greener future. And I hope that together with the public awareness from greater monitoring outside schools uh, through vehicles themselves, etc will put pressure to a faster change so thank you so much all right thank you very much and i'm uh, again delighted to say that you've agreed to stay and be part of our panel discussion as well so don't go too far no. but we're going to take a step back for the moment and you mentioned uh rosamond kissy deborah and the incredible work that she's done on on behalf of well, all young people, um, not just in London, but well beyond that, um, in, in memory of her daughter and the tragic loss of her daughter who had asthma as a result of air pollution. And we're going to hear a short piece from her now, alongside uh, Andy Street, who's the Mayor of West Midlands Combined Authority. Hi there, Andy Street, Mayor of the West Midlands here, and delighted to join the DPD Breathe Easy conference today. First thing I should do, of course, is just say a big thank you for keeping us all supplied during the pandemic. Subject today, clean air, so, so, so important, particularly here in the West Midlands, because of course, about 1,500 people a year lose their lives prematurely in the West Midlands as a result of air pollution. So right that we think really hard about the reactions to that. And of course, it's one of the reasons why the Combined Authority has set ourselves the target of carbon neutrality by 2041. We're all busy working away at that now. Should start off with a big thank you to the private sector and indeed to DPD because you've got a big role to play in this and so it's great that you've moved I think about 10% of your fleet now to clean vehicles, green vehicles, electric vehicles. So thanks for what you've done and I'm sure there's a lot more to come. In the public sector we can of course do very much more as well and across the West Midlands the first thing that means is big investments in public transport, improving our railways, 
our bus system and interestingly we've now got 50 million just coming for a complete electric bus replacement in Coventry. Hydrogen buses being repl replacing on the routes from Warsaw into Birmingham out to Solihull. And of course, we're also extending our metro system and we're putting big money behind cycling as well. About 270 additional miles of cycle paths we want to achieve. So lots we can do to give people choices about leaving their car at home and moving to clean, green transport. It's all about that modal shift. And the last thing that we're just trying to do to encourage that is what we call mobility credits. It's a great new idea being trialled this coming year. We're actually incentivising citizens to say, I'll leave my car, I'll get rid of my car, and I will instead turn completely to public transport. So lots we're trying to do, lots you're trying to do, but together we can achieve that 2041 target. Thanks a lot. My name is Rosamond Aduki Sidebra and I am the WHO Advocate for Health and Air Quality and I also run the Ella Roberta Family Foundation. The foundation takes up literally all my time. Um, I set it up when my late daughter passed away and it's to raise awareness of the dangers of asthma and the impact of air pollution on health. The reason why I'm, I'm actually doing this video, um, I feel incredibly strongly about it. And also after sitting in my late daughter's inquest, I feel this is something that we all need to be aware, aware of, how it impacts our health on, on a daily basis. It's something I've come to know over the past seven years, really. Um, we can conclude it probably even affects more people, almost 9 million people now worldwide. And it's linked to so many illnesses um, that lots of people suffer from cardiovascular, diabetes, asthma. Um, when there's a spike in air pollution, lots more people go to hospital with heart attacks, asthma attacks. I still believe that not many people actually realize how quickly especially young lungs are affected. Um, I sometimes think people think we have, I don't know, maybe months or years, but I've learned again about my daughter. It was very immediate. When there was a spike in air pollution, it would affect her airway straight away. So that's immediately. I don't think we have as much time as even I first thought. Um, so when children are walking up and down a busy road, they are being infected, you know, they are being impacted there and then, rather than six months or 12 months or 18 months. The impact is real immediate. Um, this is the only way about it. People, we can't assume people know. So ultimately, we have to find a way of making the invisible visible. I just think more, much, 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 much more needs to be done. And if we raise the awareness, the way we raise the awareness of COVID, then maybe there will be a completely different response. We have to admit the response has not been adequate. We talk about it in these niche groups, and I know about it, a lot of the people there know about it, but I'm talking about the public at, you know, wide out there. They don't know. They know some, but they don't know enough. They don't know how immediate it is. I have to have hope. Um, I never gave up hope with her and I'm not going to give up hope now. But it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult because so many things are not going the way they should. And sometimes it's quite difficult for me to express how passionate I am, how worried I am that more and more people will, will die unless we take this matter seriously. But we all have to do our bit. And I'm not talking about individuals, so people shouldn't think I'm pointing the finger. Um, governments, mayors and cities, boroughs, and where they lead. And if they have schemes, people will follow because people generally want cleaner air. Well, it's hard not to be very affected, isn't it, uh, by the words from Rosamond. And thank you so much, Rosamond, as well, for being here and, and listening in today. Um, we don't want to be niche. <laughs> you're, you're quite right in identifying that it hasn't been front and centre of 
policy agenda for, for long enough now. Um, so that's why it's brilliant to bring all these minds together today to talk about it. Let me bring back in then all our speakers so far. I'll introduce them to you all once again, just to remind you. We've got Ollie Crawn, who's head of uh, CSR for DPD. Oliver Lord, head of policy and campaigns for the Global Clean Air Environmental Defence Fund. Tom Byrne, head of CSR for ASOS and uh, Francis Pope, Professor Francis Pope, Chair of Atmospheric Science at the University of Birmingham and still with us as well, Garrett Davis MP, who is the Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Air Pollution. Um, Francis, let me bring you back into the discussion, but, but of course anyone, you know, raise your hand at any time if there's something that you'd like to say. But Francis, I think almost all our speakers have mentioned the pandemic. How much do you think our increased knowledge and our increased awareness around these kinds of issues is going to help push air pollution and clean air to the forefront? Yeah, I think very much. I mean, I guess there's several ways to think about that. But first, the, the lockdown clearly improved the environment, the air got cleaner, and lots of people appreciated it. I think uh, we, we mentioned noise pollution as well earlier, so lots of people talking about hearing the birds, I live next to a canal, I could actually see fish in the canal, um, you know, so it's so overall environment ha has improved and I think people enjoyed it. So I think that's very positive. I think the other way to look at it is you can see how far science can move when there's an emergency. Uh, and clearly COVID is an emergency, but I'd argue that air pollution is also an emergency. Well, I, how frustrating is that then from your point of view as a scientist, sort of seeing the ability and the kind of potential of when brilliant minds come together in a concerted effort along with governments and there's all this international cooperation. I don't know how you can sort of take that platform and, and put it onto something like air pollution. Um, it is frustrating, but um, I think we have to be aware of the myth of the scientist. Just because we say something's true doesn't mean that the politicians have to do it, but they've got many things they have to look after to give them some credit. So. You know that you have to balance everything but i think air pollution is such a pressing issue that it, it does need to come up the agenda and, and can can you just as well just kind of distill for us because we've talked about rosamond's experience with her daughter but the long-term health impacts particularly on children of breathing in these particles rosamond was talking about the immediacy of when air pollution levels are high but what about the build-up of that over time yes so over time, we see estimates of years lost, about 1.5 years on average, which is, you know, is a, is a good percentage of our lives which are lost due to air pollution. I mean, again, this will depend, as I said earlier, where you live, where you work, where you go to school, what your susceptibilities are. Do you have asthma, etc.? cetera? But, but clearly these are big numbers and should be taken very seriously. Darren, did you want to come in on that point? Yeah, if I may, just briefly, um, there's been a number of reports, one in Harvard, uh, one in um, uh, in Germany, showing that just the one microgram extra of PM 2.5, and in some places we're running at 15, of course, uh, you get an 8% increase in COVID deaths, and uh, the estimates go up to 14%. And also there's increases in infection itself, because the uh, ACE2 receptors that receive the virus actually inflamed in the nose and the throat by pollution uh, and we've got you know it's something like 64,000 people died prematurely last year by the silent killer of pollution it's the same number as happened from covid essentially but this is happening every year so we do need to take action and, and push it up the public agenda and i very much hope that will be part of the cop 26 agenda because the easiest way for individuals to tangibly change climate change is through being supported in shifting towards non-fossil fuel transport, heating, etc. Yeah, there's a great opportunity there. Oliver, do come in, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, and, and clearly as, as, as both the speakers were just saying, it's not all about mortality, it's about this big impact in morbidity, morbidity and, and the impact it's gonna have some, on society for decades to come. So when estimates have been done of the impact of policy in London, it's gonna save the health and social care system about five billion pounds in the coming decades. So it's a massive impact. You can, you can put it, look at it from an economic standpoint, but you also look at it from the individual standpoint, having to live with chronic illness throughout their life as well. 
Yeah. Well, economics does always come into it, um, doesn't it? And look, from the point of view of the businesses represented here, ASOS and DPD, that will be part of your, your calculation. In fact, Ollie, we had a question earlier, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if you have the numbers to hand Ollie Crawn, but have you any idea how much money DPD is actually saving by converting to electric vehicles? Or has that balance not has that not quite evened out yet from the initial investment? It's a huge investment. Rachel, it's not, it's not a saving. There are obviously diesel versus electric, you know, charging and fueling. There are some savings. But as I said, you know, diesel um, three and a half tonne vehicle is typically about £25,000. The electrical equivalent that has come to market is nearly £45,000. So there's huge investment that we, you were not saving at the moment. You know, um, we need to see that cost driven down. And, and make electric vehicles more accessible to everyone. Let's talk about um, ultra low emission zones then, ULE zones, which are an important part of current government, government policy anyway. Do the panel think ULE zones are an important factor? What can we do to encourage the rollout of more of them? Who wants to come in on that? Is that your, Oliver Lord, is that more your area of expertise? Well, I helped develop that scheme in, in London and uh, I mean, actually, it was first announced in 2013 and it's subsequently driven national policy. And we're now seeing sort of arguably a bit of differing and delaying around whether these schemes should be introduced elsewhere in the UK. But they are absolutely essential to meeting these legal limits for pollution that we haven't met now for the past 10 years and, and driving down emissions. So I absolutely advocate them. And I think you, uh, I'd be interested to hear DPD's perspective, but it's probably really has helped to egg on industry to move a little bit faster with uh, the transition to cleaner technology as well. And we need to sort of push from behind, but obviously uh, support from the front at the same time. So, so there's a bit of nudging going on as well. And what about, I mean, I know it seems almost every month or pre-pandemic anyway, we had announcements from cities like Bristol and Manchester and Oxford that they are going to become the first carbon neutral cities. Um, which will encompass all those kinds of policies as well. Um, how much is that going to drive forward, do you think, ambition? Yeah, I mean, as a lot of us say, I think if you do the climate, you also do the pollution at the same time. A lot of the solutions are the same. We've got to make sure we don't do go back to mistakes like diesel, but I, th I think that's really going to push ambition across the board. Yeah. It's part of the global movement, like I was saying as well. Yeah. Um, Tom Byrne, let me bring you in here. Um, from ASOS and um, a, a lot of the questions that were coming through were not just about what ASOS is doing front end but what they're doing back end and and the sort of entire philosophy around um the model on which a company like ASOS is based which is you know high or um high volume product purchase now ASOS is not going to be the only online brand that um works like that but is there a contradiction between that and your ambitions to be more sustainable tom so i i think there's there's lots of retailers out there who are who are shifting to you know our online business model and you know the shift of many retailers who are you know using online deliveries as a as a as a method of engaging their customers i think what's really important is that we are we are understanding um the the impacts um of of business onto the environment, onto our societies, and we're delivering responsibly as best we can, and and that's why you know our carbon twenty twenty program starting twenty fifteen was 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 born, so we could get more data, understand the issues, and and help deliver solutions, and and our long term targets we'll be setting later this year for the next ten years, will 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 do the same. So I think there's an onus on all business to understand. Uh, their part to play in, in these topics and then and then partner on solutions you know we are not the only uh, company that work with dpd in the uk for example we we um we obviously have a great relationship with them but it's on it's on it's on it's on our, on our industry to work with our partners such as dpd and others to make sure that we are all, all moving in the right direction because it's very hard for individual stakeholders and individual businesses to to, to do that alone yeah and if i can bring you in again Ollie uh, Crawn, on that one, people are asking about DPD's kind of decision making process in all of this. Um, Desire says, what made DPD decide to invest heavily in air quality monitors? Did you identify a business case or were there other reasons for taking the decision, Ollie? 
it's part of our thought leadership and our strategy, Rachel. We we're doing it because we think it's the right thing to do. You know, as I said, investment in electric vehicles is is not a saving; it's actually more expensive. Um, but we see that you know we want to deliver and act responsibly with a strategy moving forward to reduce our emissions. And then, like I said, it's not just our vehicles. This encompasses the entire business and our operating. Uh, and a year ago, we added a, a fourth pillar to our strategy to be the UK's leader in sustainable delivery. And that now is in everyone's DNA in the business, you know, on a daily basis. They see that and they're part of that. Um, another question here. I can't remember if you actually said this because I know the answer because we've spoken about it previously. But uh, Sarah asks this, how many EVs do you hope to have in your fleet by 2025? Depending on volume uh, of parcels, we, we'd be looking at probably three and a half to four thousand electric vehicles by that time. And can we talk tyres now? Um, because we touched on it together earlier. I don't know whether this is one for Francis or Oliver Lord. Who wants to take up the whole issue of tyre emissions? Um, Rosamond actually submitted a question herself earlier saying, you know, is, there seems to be evidence that these could be as bad as exhaust particles potentially. So what do we know about that? Oliver Francis, hands up who wants to take that one. Oh, Geraint, please do come in. Yeah, yeah. I think I mentioned earlier that um, clearly PM2.5 is a measurement of a particulate. It isn't a measure of toxicity. And diesel particulates are more toxic than other, some other particulates, including tires. And there is a danger of getting all that. Obviously, it's not a good idea to inhale a lot of tire particulates. Understand me. We need to get do more on that. There needs to be more science on this. Obviously, there's talk about particulates and in tubes as well, where you inhale polys and bits of metal as well. But um, I think it's it's important not to distract from the fact that diesel particulates are more toxic, um, and also that electric vehicles actually slow down using the electric energy to re-energize and therefore generate less particulates than diesel uh, cars do from the tyres as well. Well, that's pretty comprehensive. Oliver Lord, yeah, please come in. I was just going to add, I think, um, if I can be cheeky and put the challenge to Ollie that, you know, it's, it's laudable getting more and more electric vehicles in the fleet, but I think that the challenge is to start to maybe reduce the size of the motor vehicle fleet as well, because we, we've seen your aspirations with cycle freight as well. I don't think the UK, if we're going to meet our climate goals, but also clean air goals, can probably sustain the 30 million vehicles uh, in the country. And we need to think quite cleverly about actually using less vehicles at the same time. Ollie. I think, uh, Oliver, you can see that our fleet is not, and you've mentioned the, the uh, e-bike, we have Paxter, which is a, a like a quadris, um, quad, quad bike style vehicle that Norwegian Post use uh, a lot, actually. And I think it's a fluid situation. You know, we need to keep reviewing uh, the what's on market, what's available, what is uh, also the best business case as well as environmental case. Um, but we are looking at every single item. We actually um, help produce the quadricycle EAV that we use on fleet. So you can see that we work in partnership with people to bring sort of new products to, to market that can help that. And other businesses are rolling out the EAV across uh, the country as well now. So that, that's helped obviously gain momentum in the e-bike industry. The other thing is there's this huge opportunity isn't there, with the potential for a big rethink about the way we live our lives and the way we design our city centres and our town centres. And there's been all this discussion about people moving out of office space. We don't really know how much people are going to come back into city centres, redesigning them, taking roads out of them potentially, um, encouraging people to sort of exist more locally. Um, Francis, how positive do you feel about that opportunity genuinely being grasped now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the one trouble is we have to remember that cities are quite efficient in terms of distances travelled, etc. Um, and also in terms of things like heating and transport required. So I think, I think we have to be careful with that argument. Um, 
but they, there's, there's clearly opportunities there. I mean, so working from home, it's easy for me to say this, and I'm sure most people on this panel, it's easy for them to say, right, they have jobs where you can work from home. So we shouldn't forget about people who, who that, that's not available for. Um, but, yeah, no, I think there's, there's clear benefits um, with air quality and also picking up on what Geraint said earlier about the climate change and COP26 being in the UK this year. I think, you know, they are two sides of the same coin. So, you know, this does give us an opportunity to reduce our climate emissions and also our air quality emissions. Yeah, uh, John Forsyth raises that very question, actually, that you talk about work from home. He says, should companies, UK government perhaps, um, feel working from home should be encouraged to improve air pollution and or environment? in the future. There's been a bit of mixed messaging around that in terms of government policy. I don't know where you feel the sort of message should be, Francis. I think it's really difficult. As I say, from my point of view, I'd, I'd happily work from home ever more. I think I'm more efficient, it's environmentally more friendly, etc. But, you know, I have my network already. I'm old enough and ugly enough now that I know who to call and talk to, right? Whereas I think it's the younger people we have to worry about with this sort of attitude. Um, you know, we have to give people the chance to network and not just online. Yeah. Uh, Garen, from a politician's perspective, yes, what would you like to say on that? Yeah, well, I've got a, I think I've got a quite radical view on this. And I think I agree with your sentiment that you know, I think we need to put a full stop on this idea that we've got to travel further and faster and more frequently all the time. I know most people are in favour of HS2 and the like, we understand that, but really we need to sort of pause and think, well, look, if instead of five days a week you were in the office, you were just four days a week and we took 20% out of congestion, then we wouldn't, yeah, 20% out of traffic rather, we'd take some of that 80% out of congestion, and we wouldn't have to build all these roads. And I think the, um, the obviously we'd have an appalling uh, pandemic, but you know, this meeting on Zoom, we, many of us probably wouldn't be on it, at it, if it wasn't via Zoom. And Zoom, and the pandemic has brought forward these opportunities. And I've spoken before, as you I'm sure have, but to people across the country, and we can't, and we can do this sort of thing. I and mean, obviously we shouldn't do this uh, solely instead of going to work or anything, but clearly it's a new way of thinking and we should uh, sort of reset and recalibrate, have a sustainable sort of transport infra infrastructure where people have got confidence in it. And as you said, live local, and if possible buy local deliver local and do it in clusters we don't go back and forth to the same place to, th to think about all these efficiencies in terms of our public health our public good and our environment but who makes that happen Geraint is that policymakers at local level is it about leadership from from Westminster or any of the national parliaments how do you how do you see that actually working or is it kind of driven by business decisions yeah, I mean, um, obviously, there's uh, multiple uh, stakeholders in this, and I mean, I'd like to see the you know the public sort of uh, pushing forward on this to help politicians push on it. And there needs to be strategic planning, whether it's from UK government, Welsh government, you know, City of Manchester, whatever. And clearly, as Ollie said, there's also business leadership. I mean, some of this is. Um, uh, it, I mean, it, we have to accept, despite what Ollie said about you know. Uh, as it were, him wanting to help the world, and people do want to help the world, it has to be sound from a business point of view as well. And looking forward, if you're running this sort of distribution system, if you anticipate, you know, there's going to be more charging in urban centres where we do more desperately need electric vehicles to improve air quality, then you know local governments are going to charge you. So it's a good idea to invest now and to get consumer benefits and to be ahead of the game before 2030. And government need to provide this fiscal framework and the sort of full Forward, sort of plan for business and for consumers to make the right choices for all of us. Yeah, um, I know so many people, Iman makes the point, with COVID, a lot of London streets have moved towards pedestrianisation. That's happened in Manchester as well. I'm sure it's happened all over the place. Just haven't had the chance to go out and enjoy it, sadly. Um, has this got a permanent place in smaller towns as well? Again, that, that needs sort of active decision making from local policy makers but there are offsets to that aren't there Oliver come in on that one Oliver Lord well I suppose in my presentation I was just showing those maps of the pollution right and it's no coincidence you can make out these massive roads in cities and I think you know the, the task I put was if the government wants to spend 27 billion pounds on new roads and building roads actually maybe diverting that funding and helping to transform the roads and cities to address the health inequities these roads are causing and actually capture people's imagination that we can reimagine the city environment because everyone's habit has now been broken and what an amazing opportunity to rebuild for the better i think as we emerge from the pandemic yeah and um, one thing that struck me in all this discussion we're talking about 
um, we're talking about the impact all this has on, 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 on children. Oliver Lord, you brought this up on particularly people living in areas of high population density. Um, that particularly affects potentially deprived areas uh, where there's a high population of black and mi Asian minority ethnic communities as well. Um, we're sending our children back to schools and we're saying we must have good ventilation. Francis Pope, we must have all the windows open. How does that work if you're in a school right on a main road? Yeah, tricky one. Um, yeah, I, I honestly don't know. You'd have to look at the relative risks between the two of them, but, but a very tricky one. I mean, you know, there's different window, you know, there, there, there's maybe engineering solutions you can think about it, but clearly it's a very tricky. You've got to weigh the relative risks and choose what's right there. But I, I wouldn't like to, I wouldn't like to back a particular horse on that one. I, th I mean, it's a classic all the way through this pandemic, isn't it? Gerard, have you any thoughts? Yeah, on no, well, I think it's a key question. And it's another reason for the monitoring that Ollie was mentioning and for monitoring outside schools to put the pressure on local authorities and others to take action. I mean, if you are near a busy, uh, near a busy road, I mean, there are, you know, ways of providing barriers. There are ways of providing uh, speed limits. There are ways of providing the barriers around schools. There are ways of stopping sort of loitering parents with their car engines on. And the other thing is indoor air pollution. There's a lot of problems with sort of chemicals indoors and in furniture and the like. Cleaning in schools ideally should be done the night before, not the morning of. Otherwise, everyone shuts all the windows. And then there's, and you, you breathe in all these chemicals. And then the other thing is there's a sort of um, conflation of outdoor and indoor pollution that causes inflammatory problems as well. So, I mean, it's important, I mean, in the worst analysis cases, we should sort of read of either move traffic or move schools. But the, the issue of having the information is vitally important uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, all these things are kind of, payoffs aren't they you, you you do one as we've learned throughout the course of this whole pandemic you do one but there's a consequence to that so so how do we sort of measure as as francis himself put how do you measure relative risk interesting question here it's a slightly different area um, as we're coming towards the end of our discussion from alan he says have we looked at the energy demand for domestic energy consumption increased due to work from home it will offset some transport emissions but by how much uh, I'm looking at you, Oliver Lord, and, and Dr. Francis Pope. Oliver, over to you. Um, all, all I can say is we're actively looking at it at the minute. I think it's a really interesting quandary that as we all sit at home over the winter, turning on our gas boilers, or even worse, wood burning stoves, which are a big issue for particulates. Um, and then also the office building kind of being half on, having maybe some people in, it, it could be a double whammy. So I think it's really important more research has looked into that if we're headed this way of more working from home. Yeah. Um, and, and emails, even emails, Francis Pope, have a carbon footprint, don't they? Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I think, again, there's the difference here between the climate change question and the air quality question. I think working from home, there's a clear benefit for air quality. There's, there's, there's some accounting, as Oliver notes, to think about what the climate change of the heating your house and where that energy is coming from. Is it from renewables? Is it from fossil fuels etc so there's some sums that needs to do but i think from an air pollution point of view it's fairly clear that that has been beneficial well look i feel like we ought to send people away with a sense of positivity and that you know there is a moment potentially to grasp here so i wonder if i can ask you all for, for your final thoughts in, in in that regard um gary i'm going to throw that to you first of all you're the politician so you get first hit at this while everyone else can think about it um but what makes you feel sort of optimistic about the immediate future, perhaps? Well, uh, first of all, on, on this and on the last point, it is the case that businesses maybe have got three offices and now thinking about having more people working from home and, and closing a couple of those offices down. So it isn't the case as we move forward, we're going to use less energy if we work from home. We will leave, use it at home, of course, and we probably need to be paid more to stay at home to stop the emissions and to save the bill in the office. Uh, but moving forward, uh, I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, it's out of the sort of ashes of this awful chaos and pandemic to think again, in a, as we move towards COP26, 
to say, look, we want air quality very much on the agenda and the interrelationship with climate change and for government to help the people and business plan ahead so that we move towards more sustainable methods more quickly so we can, you know, get stuff in our local community. We can sort of walk to school. We can do a lot of our work online uh, and we can basically have a physical system that rewards um, uh, good behaviour that helps our health and helps our planet. Thank you, Geraint. Um, Tom Byrne, any final thoughts from you? Sure. So I think I think there's optimism in, in, in two ways. One, the the emergence of this new data will only help um, solve the issues, and and having businesses, governments, and and the public understand the data more and more over the next few years, and um, and and acting acting upon that data will will certainly hopefully give us a kickstart to. Um, to to find some more solutions on this, I also think that you know the it, it, you know, the work that DPD and others are doing are proving that setting big targets and going after them is is a great way of delivering. And um, and you know their 2025 strategy um, and the amount of vehicles on, on they're, they're increasing, um, they hopefully have a lot of ASOS parcels in them, but will we'll, we'll go a long way in in. Um, in, in, you know, in, in driving down you know, air quality issues across urban areas. So then the, the, the combination of two, you know, setting big meaningful targets and using data to inform those targets um, will drive really positive change. Thank you, Tom. Ollie Crawn, Tom's almost done your job for you there, but <laughs> where do you see the positives moving forward? This is the defining decade, Rachel. We need to act now, I think DPD approving that, you know, people can, can make changes, even small changes, have a, a positive impact um, instead of waiting for the next technology or for the technology to be proven. We need to make make movement. Um, we need to um, really make the, the place a better a better place to live in for uh, current generations and future generations. And I think our project Breathe shows that private and public sector can work together, you know, and provide uh, information that can really help improve. You know, um, if anyone is watching and is interested in being sort of part of their own project, breathe, I can put them in contact with Pollute Track that manufacture the uh, sensors. You know, um, on a group level, DPD across Europe will have one of the largest air quality monitoring systems um, in Europe with over two and a half thousand sensors placed. So it's not just UK based. Um, and what we're doing to decarbonize our fleet and act, you know, and be more responsible with, you know, we want to decarbonize, we want to move quicker. Um, so there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and there's something else to take away is that actually the average car journey is only eight miles a day, each journey. And singular occupancy car journeys have increased in the pandemic because people don't want to take public transport. So it's not just parcel delivery fleets, logistics fleets that need to act, people need to change their behavior. Because when you think about it, one of our delivery vehicles has 150 to 200 parcels on it delivering. You know, in a way that's taking vehicles off the road, singular occupancy or, you know, going to, you know, to, to make a journey. So there are positive changes and we need to just change our behavior and think twice maybe before jumping in that car for a, a short, short journey where we could maybe walk or cycle as well you know and that's healthier for the the body and the mind and that's easily said when the weather's like this as well at the moment of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and oliver lord has his bike behind him so i clearly is a cyclist <laughs> showing my colors eye but yeah i think on the behavior change obviously as consumers as well we need to think very carefully about um, our behavior as well which i think both tom and ollie have talked about in their talks i'm really optimistic that I think I'm, I'm hopeful that people will talk to one another, their neighbours, their friends about how their life has changed over the past year and that side of things perhaps for the better and just kind of latch onto that and actually think how we can actually reimagine our lives in, in the decade going forward. Last year was the decade of diesel, this year is the end of diesel, uh, this decade sorry and hopefully this year perhaps um, and that will really transform our lives for the better. Now from that point of view when you put it like that it's, it's really quite exciting and finally a word from you Dr Francis Pope. Um, thanks. Yes. Yeah, so from a science point of view, I mean, I think it's clear that air pollution is a spatial problem. And so it's really positive the work that DPD is doing in this part to give us more data. And I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to looking at that data in more depth. Uh, the second science point, I think, is we really do need to link air pollution with climate change. 
um, and, and that will come benefits. And then from a more personal point of view, I think it's just trying to keep those environmental benefits that have come out of this disastrous year, but, you know, bring some positives out of it. Yeah, well, that's a brilliant note to end on. Thank you so much to all of you, to Oliver Crawn from DPD, Oliver Lord from the Global Clean Air Environmental Defence Fund, Geraint Davis as well from uh, the All Party Parliamentary Group on Air Pollution, Tom Byrne from ASOS, and, and finally you heard there from Professor Francis Pope uh, from the University of Birmingham, and to, to all our other speakers, particularly Rosamond as well, who's been here with us throughout the morning too. We really um, are thankful to you all. And we've had an amazing number of people uh, join in and uh, watch and listen to this discussion between three and 400 being active all the time, which is absolutely fantastic. A number of you have asked, will the presentation be available? It will be, we're gonna uh, make sure it goes out to, to those who've registered to attend today, uh, if they would like it. And also the slides will be made available. Um, grateful to uh, all our panelists today who've said that they will share those slides so they can be disseminated to, to those who've asked for that as well. So thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you from me on behalf of DPD, Breathe Easy. I hope we've given you a huge amount to think about and maybe something to kind of uh, lift your spirits and feel a bit more positive about whilst also thinking very carefully about the serious issue of air pollution uh, as you go about your business today. Thank you very much for being here. Bye-bye.